Please go ahead, Bert. Good. <laughs> okay. If you would sit with your back straight, head erect, and keep focused on the spot between the eyebrows. This is imperative. Close your eyes, and it's as if you're looking inside into that spot. Picture a blackboard. <clears throat> Good. Now you feel fully centered. The topic today is going to be the four unknown facts of reality. Uh, <clears throat> to me, these four facts are the most important of all. And um, one fact of them is that um, they are the truth. And the more I realize how akin it is to the Course of Miracles, uh, the greater the validity of that fact. So now you're focused on the third eye. Tell yourself that you're going to absorb every word and the reality of it, the importance of it, to bring greater joy, peace, and love in your life. Good. And now you may open your eyes. Lately, uh, I think within the last uh, six or seven weeks, I've been having in personal instructions by the court, by the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm laughing because it, it sounds a little funny, but it lasts about an hour to two hours every day. Then I get so excited by what I received that I uh, awaken Susie and tell her what I received. Then she always reads the lesson from the course. The lesson that we are following now, which is a one one sixty seven one sixty seven. Yeah, so we've been doing it for we quite a while. We do the calendar long. daily lesson. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Does yeah. Have their and every daily. time she reads that for for the day, um, it's exactly what I dreamt the night before. Believe it or not, <laughs> this is a fact, and so it's been blowing me away how much I am being guided. Well, I came to this point that I would like to emphasize the importance of the four unknown facts of reality, and also certain facts about it that are even more um, mysterious. Number one, the best way to see that is to call it the ultimate one or emptiness. I call it God. But the reason I do not use that word, and I've been told not to use that word, because people see it as a religion. Also, that, that uh, essence of the uh, number one is based on love, unconditional love. Picture all space around you for miles and miles, or well, unlimited space. And it is all made up of love, unconditional love. This means that the moment we follow the law of the one, and what is the law of the one? Okay, I'll, I'll describe it for a moment. The law of the one is this. We have taken for granted and we live by uh, <clears throat> the law of um, time and space. We take it for granted. As a matter of fact, even I have to take a watch with me everywhere. So we, we know how important time is, but did you know that there is no such thing as time in the spirit world? Now you might say spirit world, why are we concerned with that? Because in truth, we think we are a body and that's where we make the mistake. The body is being activated by the very spirit that we are. Spirit is who and what we are completely. And it has no laws, it has no rules other than love itself. When I experienced my NDE and I was in that space, I experienced a love I, I never knew before. And yet I've got a mother that's the most loving woman I've ever known. And it was the, the greatest thing and it changed me completely. And away from the religion that I was taught as a child. And more, this happened in Malta when I was 17. Okay, so now, what is the one most important fact of the spirit world? 
there are there are two laws that have to be removed in order for us to understand the power of spirit. One is that there is no time. That's a hard one. And I'm not asking you to believe it right away, but to feel it as we go on. And space. Um, these two actually came into being when we became more scientific. For example, the computer itself doesn't follow time and space. Our phone doesn't follow time and space. You see, it can call anyone a hundred miles away. And the moment you ring, they hear the ring and they start answering. There's no space and time, see? Or we could hold a, a Zoom meeting with so many people all over the world, Australia, Russia, Germany, they'll all be there at the same time, at the same moment. There is no time or space. When we get confined in time and space and begin to think it is real or unconsciously believe it is real, we are doomed to suffer great pain, not only physically, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally, in every sense of the word. And I hopefully, uh, hopefully that we can explore it today to see how valid that statement is. Did you know that living without time is the perfect way to live? It has no beginning and no end. And that is the very nature of our being. I felt that when I was in space, I experienced that feeling of being, there's no time, my goodness. You know, and at the moment I thought, where is my body? Okay, and my body was in hospital. I went zoom into my body. And the moment I was zoomed into my body, <laughs> I felt the, the, the pain and the suffering and all that, that that I wasn't feeling in the spirit world. And uh, the, the idea of time and space came right there and then. Um, <clears throat> now, how do I begin talking about I think there's a statement here, if you could read it about, uh, I can't read, I'm blind, so, but from the course. Yeah, this is how the course describes what, how, what time was made for. God in his knowledge is not waiting, but his kingdom is bereft while you wait. All of the sons of gods are waiting for your return, just as you are waiting for theirs. Delay does not matter in eternity, but it is tragic in time. You have elected to be in time rather than eternity and therefore believe you are in time. Yet your election is both free and alterable. You do not belong in time. Your place is only in eternity where God himself has placed you forever. Oh, thank you, honey. And I, I'll continue to read the rest yeah. when you get to forgiveness later on. In the yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So so this is, this is quite something, not to think of time, when our whole world is made up minute by minute, what to do, the scheduling and everything. But yet there is a, a, state, a state of mind, uh, a calmness that comes where you actually begin to not live in time, but to live in the moment. Uh, children do it, animals do it, dogs definitely do it, you see, uh, by their spirit. So now you might say, but I have to work with time. Yes, definitely you work with time, but remember that you're not subject to time. And there's a difference. And as we go along, uh, you might ask some questions and we'll go into them. So the truth is that there is no time and space. This means that if there is no time and space, in truth, we have something to look forward to. That when we shed our body, we actually begin to live in that timeless space, timeless and spaceless space, uh, which is really heaven itself, which is total joy, total fulfillment, total love, unconditional love. Um, did you know that if time did not exist, there would be no such thing as anything negative? You couldn't tell, you couldn't tell a lie if you wanted to. 
everything will be directed by love. But the reason we keep falling back, it is because we made the two laws of time and space relevant to our earth living. And so these are lessons that we need to learn. Now, there have been, according to IANS, the International Association of Near-Death Studies, which I'm a member, <clears throat> they found out that 10 million people have experienced the light when they came back. Now, there is the, there's the factor of why did they come back? Well, first of all, the recently, as it happened about 30 years ago or so, the doctors discovered resuscitation of the heart. So if you had a heart attack, for example, it can be brought back to life. And this is wonderful. And because people were brought back to life, they started talking about a heaven that they left behind and they wanted to come back. They didn't want to come back to the body <laughs> because they had such a good, great time where they were. So this is when the investigation started and now hundreds and even thousands of books have been written about the state beyond time called the heavenly state or the, the kingdom state or uh, whatever. The subject, why are we thrown back into the body? Uh, because we are told we haven't finished what we need to finish on earth, the lessons that we need to learn. So what lesson do we need to learn? Nobody told us that psychology didn't tell me that. That's why I gave it up. Philosophy didn't tell me that. Nothing told me that until I realized it by simply working on the course. And it's true. Living from time <clears throat> is what subjects us to ego and fear and uh, all the other good things. <laughs> all those wonderful things. <laughs> all those wonderful things, right. Uh, now I'd like to emphasize that number one is the, the number one from the four, which is known as emptiness. And the reason it is known as emptiness because spirit itself is empty. Emptiness does not mean void. <clears throat> it means that there is nothing tangible in it. There is no matter. Matter knows a beginning and an end, but spirit knows no beginning and no end. And so when you're in it, when you're in the spirit state, you are living beyond time and space. You're living in the perfect state of uh, unconditional love. So we call that state because it's, um, it's a spirit. You know, it's not physical, it's not seen, it's not experienced. But the one who's experiencing it is of course experiencing everything as that one, see? Um, I, I remember saying this, but I, I, I'd like to repeat it at this point. When I was taken to hospital in 19, uh, 19 oh, 2007? That's right, yeah, yeah, the day. Um, yeah, um, the moment I was on the gurney and arrived in the hospital, I was <laughs> gone into the spirit world. <laughs> And as I roved around the hospital, I saw the doctors, the nurses, and the, uh, all the other people as parts of myself. Let me explain. I would look at, for example, the doctor, okay? And the moment I look at him, I knew everything about him. His likes and his likes, his, his beliefs, his thoughts, his past, his, even his future, everything was known to me at that moment. And then I would look at the nurse, same thing happened. I look at the patient, same thing happened. And then it occurred to me later, what was happening is that I was really seeing myself. There was no judgment in what I saw. There was no good or bad in what I saw. I simply saw that I was looking at another part of myself. This reinforced the truth. Actually, the only truth we have is that everything is one. Everything is one. Now, please feel that. Everything is one. Every person that you look at now, every person that you see in the street is you in a different form. Sometimes it's very, very hard to understand because we feel so alienated. We feel, 
full of judgment and we make so many remarks and blah, blah, blah. Not realizing that every time we make a remark against another, that is quite something. We are making it about ourselves. This is how we, through the earth experience, learn unconditional love, which becomes so beautiful. Because the moment you're angry at anyone at all, you are angry at yourself. Never, never at where you think the anger is uh, concentrated on. So everything goes into that one. You are the one. Now you might say, but if I am the one, every, every, you know, everyone is myself, uh, then how do I relate? Do I relate as bird? Or do I relate as I am? Or how, how do I relate? And the question does not arise when you enter it. Because the moment you feel that love, you are, feel so alive, so one with whatever is, that at the moment the thought of separation never enters the mind. So now comes the word that brings all the suffering of time and space. It's called separation. See, initially, and we're talking about the first form of emptiness now, the first part. That knew no time. There was no time. Time never existed. It always was. Science never knew that. And so they said there was a big bang when everything started, and there was the beginning, and sometimes it's called the fall of man. It wasn't really the fall of man. It was what was needed at that point for, for us to experience. Somehow or other, this allness that we are wanted to experience itself. And so it created a body. The body was created by, you can call it the DNA, the, 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 the different aspects of us. Did you know that we created everything in the earth? Because we say, uh, no, you, you got created by this force or that force or whatever. See, the, the, the truth is that when we fell, what is the, the word falling into? Uh, separation, the separation, desire to be separated. The desire to be separate. So yeah. that you know yourself, mm -hmm. you know, it was the tiny, uh, the course calls it the tiny mad idea. Okay, it was mad because from then we started knowing suffering. Yeah, exactly. Suffering, and the suffering got worse and worse the more we separated. And that's why we have wars and we have uh, struggles and everything else. Because these are not bad, believe it or not. I never knew that. I was brought up in the war. I saw death all around me. I was six years old when, when I saw houses being blown up and people screaming and yelling all around, bombs falling everywhere. You know, Malta was a British dominion at the time, so that's why I attacked Malta. It had all the British fleet in it. On, in it. But anyway, um, but it was later, and my mother taught me, she was Italian, my mother, great lady. She taught me that war itself is not wrong as we think it is. It is the ignorance of not knowing who we are. I, and my mother was never religious. It was, you know, she, she just knew. <laughs> Anyway, I don't want to go into my, my family, uh, but I was brought up to believe by the Catholic Church that I was born in sin and that uh, I suffer because of me being born in sin. Okay, so, so that was my need. <clears throat> uh, but as I experienced my true state in the, in the spirit world, I knew that everything is perfect already, but we need to learn it through one thing only. It's called love. So the only thing that makes sense on our earth is learning to love, learning to see that every body that you look at is another part of you. That's, that's a big one, you know, but it does work because as you begin to forget yourself, you begin to see that every time you have animosity, every time you have hate, every time you 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 were angry at anyone, you feel it. You're the one that's suffering. 
And, and so by dealing with it and forgiving it, which we're going to learn a little bit later, that very forgiving be becomes our fast way to, to the state beyond time. Um, now we'll go into number two. I'd like to go into number two, unknown facts of life. Number one is, like I said, it, it is the, uh, the emptiness itself. I call it God for my own satisfaction because I like the word God. Uh, to me, it means it's all one, okay? Uh, to me, God is not a religion. It is not a belief. It is, it's meaning it's all one. Everything is just one, okay? But you can call that oneness like Buddha calls it the um, nirvana. nirvana, right? Which is a beautiful word. So it's all because the nirvana is the, is the, the joy of that oneness, really, of that knowing. Now we go into number two, number two unknown fact of reality. Number two unknown fact of reality is this that the very emptiness we are is the greatest fear of mankind. I didn't know that through psychology. I never learned it. Isn't that a kick in the pants, eh? Yeah. So, so this, this, is the, this is the thing. Number one is oneness. But number two is the greatest suffering. And the greatest suffering is the fear of emptiness. In fact, that word emptiness itself, most people hate it. Not only they don't <laughs> like it, they hate it. Why? Because it presents an ending, annihilation, you see? Empty, empty. Um, there, there's no meaning that the mind can grasp, but emptiness is everything. Everything is really empty. Appears as something by time and space. Oh, isn't that a kick, eh? And you get to that realization by knowing that, really knowing that. Now I look at anything, my own apartment, the, the world. I made it all up. <laughs> Not me, but you know what I mean. You see? And, uh, and the, the matter that we see, everything came about to look as if there is a world. But this world is made up of time and space. And as we experience it fully and completely, that is not denying anything, not hating anything, but simply understanding that every time you feel limited, every time you don't feel happy, you are going against yourself because your own very spirit is the highest form of joy, is the highest form of happiness, the very spirit you are. Okay, so number two, you might say, what, what is the emptiness we feel? Well, well, my goodness, I've had so many people. I was a, a hypnotherapist for many, many years. And people, the, the people used to come to me, they used to say, oh, Bert, I feel so empty, so empty. What they meant was the emptiness of the heart, not emptiness of stuff. <laughs> so in other words, for example, uh, what is our greatest known human fear? death okay we really think we die and because we really think we die that very word itself becomes the fear of emptiness oh, oh i'm going to be no more see there's no such thing not only you are more when you die but you go into the spirit world of your true nature that was never born you were never born Am I making this clear? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. But the fear of emptiness, you were talking that emptiness is another word for God or another word for love, but love and God have conceptual ideas that they're very conceptual, whereas emptiness is a little less conceptual because emptiness is something that's kind of obvious. So it's a helpful word, but saying that, so it makes sense why understanding it's a fear of emptiness because that shows you what it is. And so by seeing that, that lessens the fear a little. But could you also say that the fear of emptiness is the fear of God? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. And incidentally, there are many people that are, that are proud to be godless. I don't believe in God. There are many, 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 many people. 
And, and the reason for that is simply because they fear emptiness, but they don't know it consciously. You see, the fears that we have are unconscious. In other words, we're not aware of them at all. So our job on earth, the way we revolutionize and come back to spirit is to begin to understand that every fear we suffer is not bad. It is a need for love, okay? Love is the emptiest of words because love is not something. Did you know that? Love is not something, love is. You know, when you say the word is, it's the most beautiful word in, in, the, in the English language because it just is. It means mm -hmm. there's no beginning and no end. God is, love is. That's amazing because I just had a thought of what yeah. you just said about love. Love can be seen as total acceptance, which is just is. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Total acceptance. Total acceptance. Of what is, which is empty. Right. Total acceptance mm -hmm. of what is. Mm -hmm. When you start making up your mind that those people are horrible, that those people are, they should be killed. <laughs> it's not love. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not only not love. Your words are not <clears throat> making them suffer. You are the suffering from Look at those words. Because <clears throat> every time you wish the worst for someone, you are wishing it for yourself without realizing it. Because the link that we have with every living being is so strong, <clears throat> but the mystery is, I'm sorry, am I? It's okay, <clears throat> can I get you something, sweetie? No, no, it's okay. The, mis the, the, the mystery is that, <clears throat> what was I saying here? Uh, We're talking unconditional love and the mystery, or sorry, acceptance, complete total acceptance, and, and as opposed to judging. And, and how judging isn't love. Yes, because uh, in truth, you are the one that's seeing your world. You are the one that's seeing everything and everything that you're seeing, you're making real. Mm -hmm. But the, the incredible thing is that in truth, we are uh, what is called uh, non-duality, you know? Uh, <clears throat> there was a master talking to a student and the master said to the student, he said, if a, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it, does it make a sound? Guess what the student said? It makes a sound. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does not. And why? Because there was no one to hear it. So in other words, to hear something requires hearing. Obvious, doesn't it? Ah, but we still don't think that way. We don't go that far. <clears throat> So if a tree falls in the forest, it does not make a sound because the sound waves that it creates are not heard by anyone. So since they're not heard by anyone and there's no one to hear it, then there's no one to hear it. So it never made a sound. So we'll begin to see that as we examine something totally for the expression that it is and go into it totally, we'll find that it's not, it's, it is not even there. <laughs> <clears throat> I had a I had a woman and uh, she attended my uh, my psychotherapy training. Um, she, she was a, a client. And then anyway, one day she she called me and she said, "Bert, I'd like to see you. I'd like to talk about the realization." And um, so she came. I think she came from California. <clears throat> anyway, she she saw me and she said. I don't have much time, but I do feel that if, if I'm going to be with you, you're going to help me reach some realization of truth. And uh, when people talk to me like that, Bert comes out and <laughs> says, oh, please don't, don't, don't start that. But anyway, so, so we went for a walk and we went to Jericho, Jericho Beach, and it was very, very hot. And then it came to me and I said to her, you know, you want to experience something beautiful? I said, there's that tree there and the trunk was huge, you know, and it's a very, very tall tree in Jericho. I love trees. And I said, now sit in front of it in the lotus position, the yoga, the, the, the way you meditate and look at it, I said, but don't call it a tree, T-R-E-E. -E. Okay, don't call it anything. 
because the moment you call it anything and you label it, it falls dead. It becomes a subject in your mind, no longer in your heart. So I said, don't call it anything. Just look at it as a thing that is alive, very alive. And she said, well, what do I do then? I said, just keep looking at it until I tell you to stop. And don't think anything else, but just look at the tree. Well, anyway, she listened. But it was very hot. I was in my sandals and the beach was about 100 yards away. I think I told you that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so <clears throat> I walked to the beach. I put my feet in the water, cooled it off. By the time I got back, it was about a half an hour. And I wanted to give her that time to be alone. Well, as soon as I approached her, she had tears coming down her eyes. And um, she was so touched, her face was so soft. And she said, Bert, the tree talked to me, she said. And, and I, I believed her. And the things that she told me were very, very touching. She said, and, and it's true, when you look at something that is alive, a tree, a flower, a plant, um, an animal, a child, anything that is alive, and you look, really, really look at it. I mean, look at it, not just with the eyes, look at it with your heart completely. And I always say heart and mind. I never confuse the two. We always think with the mind, never with the heart. And that's why I came up with five points to, to work from going from thought to feeling. But anyway, so we, she, she got the message and uh, she got into her car and she drove back to California. And uh, she, that realization changed her life. It was that simple. When we start to look with our heart and the point is always to look at the heart. The mind is always giving you a reason. You see what you're looking at and it gives you the idea. But if you get rid of that idea while you're looking and just see the life of it, just see the life of it. Uh, you see, uh, for example, I love flowers. And since I had that realization in hospital, oh, to me, flowers became just beauty itself. Now, I don't know one flower from another, <laughs> what they're called, but I'm afraid to know the name, not, not afraid, not afraid, careful. Not to know, because the moment you know the name, you think that's the flower, you see? The name is not the flower. The flower is the flower. And when you look at it, you begin to see how alive it is. So alive, like um, this, this book, incidentally, the Foreign No Facts of Reality, there is a flower here and it's passion flower. The moment I saw it, my mouth fell open and I had an, an epiphany. And I said, oh my God, look at that. Well, I said that to Susie. Susie looked at the, the flower and she, she got an epiphany too. And she said, oh my God, who created that? You see, who, who created that? No one and nothing, just the emptiness created it. You know, and all of a sudden the, the intricate wonder of it, the color, the everything. So we took a picture of it and put it in, in, in the, as, as a, as a book cover. So number two is the greatest known human suffering. In psychology, they give you so many names. As a matter of fact, there are about 28 different maladies created by the mind, right? Something, and, I read and something we went, like that. Right, yeah. And we went through them. Mm -hmm. And each one, we found it was fear of emptiness. Each one. Right. Obsessive compulsive disorder is a very good example because you know you have people who constantly have to make sure the keys they lock the door over and over and over again because mm -hmm. if, if you could see it very clearly, that's, that's right. a fear of emptiness. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So every fear is a fear of emptiness. Now, is emptiness wrong? No way. No. Fear never escape fear. Never run away from fear. Never block away from fear. But get to know it because it can teach you love you never knew before. See, fear is the opposite of love. When you stop loving, you start fearing. The moment you understand the fear, it takes you back to love automatically. But there's another thing about human nature is that we like to get even. 
we would like to, like somebody helps us, we want to hurt them back automatically. But we can't even think about it. We don't want to forgive. So there's another way to forgive our suffering and find the love that we already are. And that's called, you know, and the course is called uh, um, forgiveness. But see, this is, this is how forgiveness works. When you can look at a fear completely and really understand it, you begin to see it as nothing, really. Uh, give me an example um, of a fear that is nothing. Well, all fears are nothing because they're fear of the future. So it's something we've made up in our mind in that sense. Or something we're judging. Something we're, something. exactly, something right. we're judging. When we, we feel retaliation for a judgment, actually. That's exactly what happens. So, right. so the fear, but it gets covered over by, because if we knew that, it would be easy to, to forgive it. So it gets covered over by a worldly reason, like I'm afraid of the spider or I'm afraid of... Right. So exactly. every every yeah. fear, yeah, that's right. Every fear is a cover for this. Every fear is a cover, cover that's for this. right. Yeah. This. And as we meet each fear, hoping that it's going to teach us something, we don't know what it is. And with trepidation, we don't even want to know, but you stick it out. You begin to understand that the fear is really nothing at all, but in your mind, it's a concoction of your imagination that now memory has solidified it into something real. But did you know that nothing is real? Nothing is real except reality. But reality is empty. Reality is spirit. Nothing that is tangible is real because it's made up of energy that, is, that soon changes. You see, all the time. So when you begin to understand the fear and really look at it and feel it out, you begin to see that you're afraid of nothing. You just made it up. The moment you see the, there's no validity in your fear, it turns to love. You see, and this is how we turn to love. Now, the Course has a better explanation than I have in my book. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. I didn't know that this book helped people to understand the Course better until one day a teacher of the Course wrote me and he said, Bert, he said, you made the course so simple to understand. But anyway, that's beside the point. So, so when, when uh, and the Course in Miracles explains it the best way. And it says to look at the fear as it actually is. You, you, tell, you tell us about the, how the course tells us to look at the fear. Yeah, well, here's an example of, of with dealing back to the subject of time that we were talking about. So here's an example of how understanding time actually helps us to forgive. It says that guilt feelings are the preservers of time. So we have this memory and we think in our memory, there's something caused, we have this feeling of guilt. Memory suddenly shows up and says, oh, you feel guilty because you, you, know, you didn't say hi to the postman today or whatever reason or whatever reason it is. So that the moment you have that, now you feel, okay, the next time I see the postman, you know, he's not going to give me my mail or whatever you've got going on in your head. You've got this fear. <laughs> That's not a simple one. But when you reckon, if you if you're willing to take a breath and say, wait a second, j the same way that what I touch and see is an illusion, that my memories are also an illusion. They're actually made up now. So there is no time. They're right now. Your memory, your thoughts are feeding you a memory right now of a story that you're believing is something that happened in time. So the moment you recognize that, you're back in the now and, and you're in that state of emptiness again. That's right. <laughs> until and you the next, that, that's <laughs> empty. <laughs> until the very next ego thought that comes yeah. by and pull, tries to drag you out again. That's yeah. right. And you keep doing that over yeah. and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And you learn to live for the mm -hmm. first time. <laughs> you begin to really live because that's what being alive is. I, I, I'm blind, but uh, thank goodness for having my my perfect lady here. Um, I, I am a very happy man. And the reason I'm happy is because I have found something that can never die. In fact, uh, in fact, it becomes more and more alive in me. I don't know uh, a word to call it. I call it uh, God or I call it uh, love. But uh, it is a very real thing. And when you start living from it all the time, how do you live from love all the time? Very simple. Every time that you don't feel good, you forgive it. It's as simple as that. 
they forgive it in the same way that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And as they, as, as mm -hmm. the forgiveness becomes mm -hmm. a natural process, okay, that very natural process becomes your growth. And the growth is nothing more than simply going back to your natural state, which is itself love. See, and love is the only thing that is real. And that is, no, that is number, <clears throat> number three, the, uh, uh, the, the four and no facts. One is what we call the, the unified principle, the oneness. Number two is the fear of it, okay? And number three is forgiving the fear and learning that there's only love. Love has no time. In fact, if you love something completely, you say, oh, where did the time go? <laughs> right? Because time, time itself is, is the, the crushing of love whereas timelessness is the way to live. The more you discover this, the more you feel alive. You don't stop living by time because you can't help it, you have to. You know, we have, like I said, you know, we have a watch all the time. We have to look up to do this, to do that. But nonetheless, you might not be living in time if you don't become a victim of it. And then number four, which is the last one, the four unknown facts of reality is called trust. Trust means that now you're beginning to live it, really living it, okay? So, do not question it. That very process itself, everything, everything that happens to you becomes a benefit, becomes a joy. It brings you more and more goodness. Like I used to think, for example, um, I, like, I like money, I, I always did. And, uh, but I, I never liked it. Um, when I had my TV show, the pay was good. I went to China and, and the, the throats, no. no and uh, the money was good. And then there was a, a Japanese, not a Japanese guy. Uh, was he Japanese? Russian. Russian, Russian, mm -hmm. Russian. He saw my book, the first book I wrote. And the, he said it blew him away. He was a businessman, a very rich businessman. And he was so uh, rich. And he came to Canada on purpose with his wife just to attend. And, uh, and, uh, and then he gave me a, a bundle of things like this, a huge, huge envelope. And he gave it to me. He says, don't open it. He just... <laughs> and when I opened it, I found that there were, uh, uh, $500 bills <laughs> packed, thousands and thousands of dollars. He was a very rich man. He said, because you changed my life. And then he went back to Russia. His name is Oleg, he's a beautiful man. And anyway, um, so what I'm saying, those were rich times. Now I'm going through a very poor stage. <laughs> And we hardly have any money, but you know, you know something, it's always there. Isn't it, honey? I'm, I'm happy. I'm, uh, I'm probably yeah, happier now yeah. than whenever I had more money. Not that I wouldn't like more money, but yeah. I'm happier now. Yeah, yeah. And I, we don't want, for, I find I, we don't want, everything is met. We don't have extra. Everything is met. But everything is met. The reason I'm mentioning money, and, and I, I, mm -hmm. I apologize for mm -hmm. being misunderstood mm -hmm. here, um, is this, because we have a, an idea that the more money you have, the better you live. Exactly. That's not true. Exactly. But yeah. if you live by the law of love, the money will be there. One way or another, it will be there to always buy what you need, the food, the clothing, the living expenses, etc., etc. And so, so I hope that these four unknown facts of reality will make them a part of your life. Um, and I wanted to do it because the spirit told me to do it. <laughs> Uh, it was one when the spirit told me to do last it. Last night, 3 a.m. Last night. Uh, 2, 2 or 3 a.m. when you woke me no, up. No, I, I, it came before because oh, to talk I, told, about the book. I told Way oh, that okay. I was going to do it. Yeah. yeah, well, you mentioned, I'm not sure when that happened, yeah, but last yeah. night you were told specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> anyway, um, so that's it. Are there any questions? I have a question about trust. Okay. Um, you, in trust, your book mentions something called negative unconscious trust. 
And earlier we were talking about how total acceptance is really what you could describe love as. And I remember one day reading from your book, it's this negative unconscious trust are these beliefs we have that we don't know that are there because they're unconscious, but they might be beliefs we've had our whole life. And for example, I was walking to the store to do groceries. And I remember thinking, because I had planned my specific menu, I had the thought I was happy. And then all of a sudden this thought comes in, it says, it's not so much fun to have the same thing so often. And then I'm thinking, oh, I guess it's not. And then I thought, oh my God, that's exactly what that was. That's negative unconscious trust because Nirvana is here now. That's it, right, it, that's it, right. God's here now. Nothing can prevent God from being here now. And so we have these we have these negative beliefs that are mm. driving us that we're not even aware of. And, and so, it, like you said, every time we don't feel, we feel slightly, slightly unhappy, we need to look at what we were just thinking. Mm -hmm. And because that's what's got us. That's exactly by it. Strangle stranglehold and, and at the moment. This is yeah. why the, the, five, the five points are so beautiful. And uh, it's, it's, it's been wonderful because people, even three people had cancer, but two definitely uh, cured by, by doing the five points. And the five points are simply ways to go from becoming aware of your thought processes because people are not aware of what they're thinking all the time. Thoughts are running rampant, you know, all mm -hmm. the time. And because we are disciplined mm -hmm. by meditation, we're not disciplined in looking at ourselves. What happens is that the, the mind takes over. Mm -hmm. It gets little offense and begins to think about it, think about it, become sick, and so on and on. So, but by knowing thoughts, going on to, 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 on to, to, to the fourth point, the fourth point is when you begin to look at emptiness, you see? And then fifth, you see yourself as empty completely from everything. And the moment you do that, then you say to yourself, what is left? And of course, the mind says nothing, because the mind says, well, if, if I'm empty of everything, then there's nothing left. That's where we may make the mistake, you see? And if we can realize that what is left is who we are, and that's called... Emptiness? No, the I am. Oh, I am. <laughs> in, in other words, awareness. Awareness. You're always aware, always aware. So that's the non-dual, the non-dual state. That's the non-dual non state, state. Yeah, 